On the 27th of February 1939, a fire broke out in a large house in a tiny English village in the county of Essex, some 70 miles northeast of London. It would make headlines around the world out of all proportion to the event. When the world's attention was transfixed by Adolf Hitler's aggressive moves in Europe and the ongoing barbarous Japanese war in China. Why was this fire so infamous? For the simple reason that the house that burned was like no other. It was the most haunted house in England, and its name lives on to the present. Borley Rectory. I first became fascinated by the story of Borley Rectory in the 1980s, and was delighted to discover that Borley is only 18 miles northwest of my hometown of Colchester. Around about 1987, during the school holidays, jumping on my BMX bike and accompanied by a friend, we cycled all the way to Borley one sunny and warm day, determined to see what remained. But beware, the tiny hamlet of Borley does not welcome visitors, not then and not now. Many of the locals are actively hostile to the steady stream of interested people who make the journey along the narrow and lonely country lanes up the hill from Long Melford, where the hamlet stands. Arriving in a hot and sweaty mess in 1987 at the old entrance to what was Borley Rectory, we were told in no uncertain terms to get lost when we tried to ask some questions of a local working in the old rectory gardens. With the advent of the internet, all sorts of weirdos regularly trooped to Borley to cavort in the churchyard or hold seances and other activities, particularly around Halloween, and it's no surprise that the hostility of locals to outsiders has only increased. The church, which I entered freely in 1987, is now firmly gated and barred, unusual in England, where parish churches are almost always left unlocked and unattended. No parking is available in the village, the church car park blocked with a stout chain. Curtains twitched, but I was not challenged on two recent visits to film, but I stayed on public or church land and behaved myself. The hamlet definitely has an atmosphere. It is deadly quiet, the only sounds being the wind across the agricultural fields that surround it, and crows cawing in the big trees, and the occasional car passing through on the way to who knows where. The rectory is gone, the site of England's most haunted house now divided up into different plots of land. With a row of modern bungalows covering some of the original garden, The rectory cottage, which once stood adjacent to the rectory itself, remains. It is very similar to the phantom building, the same red bricks, the same types of windows. And what of the rectory itself? The boundary of its gardens remains in place and its main gate is also there, the gate posts long ago removed and a five-bar gate now covering the entrance. Somebody has a sense of humour, for atop the new gate posts are these fine wing griffins. They seem a deliberate joke about the site's controversial and frightening past. And so to that point, was Borley Rectory really England's premier haunted building, or is it all a load of nonsense and myth? Fireside fairy tales for the gullible, the easily duped. The rectory was a very large Victorian building put up in 1862, just across from Borley Church, the church itself dating back to the early 12th century. As the name suggests, the rectory was built to house the local vicar, in this case the Reverend Henry Bull. It was not the first rectory on the site to have burned, an earlier building was destroyed by fire in 1841. The new rectory was big, comprising 32 rooms including 10 bedrooms, which accommodated Bull's enormous family of 14 children. The Reverend Bull had responsibility for a parish encompassing three local hamlets, with about 100 or 150 parishioners. Legend has it that there was once a Benedictine monastery in the area, which fueled a story attached to the rectory of a nun 
having come from her convent to conduct an affair with a local monk from the monastery, and having been bricked up in her convent walls for having had such an illicit affair. This story was debunked in 1938, as no monastery was found in a careful search of historical records. The hauntings began as soon as the Bull family moved into the rectory in 1863. They began with strange footsteps heard within the big house. The rectory's garden was very long, 11 acres, and survives today though divided up into different plots. It stretches along Hall Road to an old summer house, now gone, that once stood in the grounds, and encompasses a path known as the Nun's Walk. In the late 19th century, several of Bull's teenage daughters claimed to have seen the ghostly figure of a nun walking this path at twilight. On the 28th of July 1900, the nun was reported some 40 yards from the rectory and disappeared when the young women tried to approach it. This nun has been seen multiple times over multiple decades and by multiple witnesses. It appears that the Reverend Bull and members of his family spoke of the nun to locals, the church organist also recounting the sightings many decades later. The Reverend Bull died in 1892 and his son, the Reverend Harry Bull, took over as parish priest, with many of his unmarried sisters continuing to live at the rectory. The nun continued to be reported by Bull family members and other strange occurrences. The more fanciful, perhaps, being a coach driven by two headless horsemen and other things. But modern thinking is that some of these alleged apparitions were embellishments to the odd goings-on at Borley added by the Reverend Bull's daughters, based on popular fictional stories widely read at the time. On the 9th of June 1927, the Reverend Harry Bull died and Borley Rectory became vacant. On the 2nd of October 1928, a new incumbent moved in to take over the living, that is, the duties of priest and the income derived from lands and rents attached to the post. His name was the Reverend Guy Smith. Smith and his wife reported odd goings-on in the rectory as soon as they moved in. Mrs. Smith found a human skull wrapped in brown paper in the back of an old cupboard. It was adjudged to be that of a young woman. <laughs> Servant bells rang at odd times, even though they were no longer connected to the individual rooms of the house. Strange footsteps were still being heard about the house, and odd lights seen in its windows. Interestingly, Mrs. Smith even reported seeing one night what she believed to have been a horse-drawn carriage in the grounds. This is where Borley Rectory was to begin to gain notoriety, not only in the local area but across Britain, and eventually the entire world. So concerned were the Smiths with the odd phenomena that they contacted the famous newspaper The Daily Mirror with a request to be put in touch with something called the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research, headed by someone called Harry Price. The Daily Mirror sent a reporter to Borley, who arrived on the 10th of June 1929, and he wrote a series of articles about the mysterious goings-on that soon made the house famous across the UK. Price arrived two days later. Interestingly, within hours of Price's arrival, all sorts of new phenomena began occurring. Stone-throwing, spirit messages written on mirrors, a vase thrown across a room all of it mimicking poltergeist activity. When Price left, the disturbances left with him. Some have called Harry Price a charlatan, who saw the publicity attached to Borley Rectory as a way to increase his own considerable fame and income. Interestingly, he was already very famous for exposing fraudulent spiritualist mediums and other charlatans, but was also an accomplished magician and conjurer. Throughout the 1920s, Price debunked many celebrity mediums, and it had gained him a large following and great fame. Certainly, later researchers believe that Price had created some of the phenomena encountered at Borley during his stays at the property, but even today his reputation remains contentious, opinion divided between his fans and his critics. 
The Smiths evidently had enough of the odd house after just over two years of living there, and they left on the 14th of July 1929. Due to the house's bad reputation, it was difficult to find a replacement priest, but on the 16th of October 1930, the Reverend Lionel Foister, first cousin of the Bull family, moved in, along with his very young wife, Marianne, and the couple's adopted daughter, Adelaide. The arrival of the Foisters saw an epic cranking up of alleged ghostly phenomena at Borley Rectory. The Reverend Foister, an old man who suffered from ill health, reported objects being thrown, bell ringing, strange writing appearing on walls, footsteps and other trying and frightening troubles. He even tried to exorcise the house on two occasions, but the second attempt ended with a big stone being thrown at him, striking him in the shoulder. However, it later emerged that Marianne Foister was not being entirely honest with her husband. She was in fact having an illicit affair with lodger Frank Peerless. Marianne would admit to having falsified most of the phenomena to cover up her sexual dalliances with the lodger. The Reverend Foister was made sufficiently ill by all these shenanigans that he retired from the job of parish priest in October 1935, Borley Rectory once more falling vacant. Vacant, that was, until Harry Price stepped in and leased the property for a year from May 1937. He set about recruiting 48 observers, mostly students, to live in teams at the rectory and research its spooky phenomena. All this was fully reported by the press, and indeed at a seance held in London in March 1938, the person conducting the seance apparently made contact, as Price reported, with the source of all the disturbances at the rectory. A young French nun who had been lured to Borley from her convent to marry a member of the Waldegrave family, the local noble family that are lords of the manor, and had been murdered in an earlier building, the site of which the rectory had been built upon centuries later. Her body had apparently been buried on the site. Her name was Marie Lair. During the seance, a second spirit, identifying himself as Sunex Amures, stated that Borley Rectory would burn at 9pm that very night, revealing the bones of the murdered nun. <laughs> Neither of these things actually occurred. Price continued his investigations, and the student observers reported many of the same phenomena reported by many other people who had lived in the house since 1863. Once Price's lease was up, a new owner moved in. Captain W. H. Gregson was unpacking personal belongings when he accidentally knocked over an oil lamp in the main hallway. The fire soon became uncontrollable. Borley Rectory was completely gutted, the roof collapsing and the house reduced to a ruin. However, a subsequent investigation suggested that Captain Gregson had deliberately set the fire. It looked like an insurance job. Borley Rectory remained standing, though left to nature, in the years after the fire, looking increasingly just like a classic haunted house. In the years that followed, some of Harry Price's fellow investigators criticised his methods and suggested that he had invented or embellished some of the phenomena. But Price published a best-selling book, The Most Haunted House in England, in 1940, further popularising the notoriety of the rectory and further burnishing his own reputation as Britain's leading ghost hunter. The ruined house continued to deteriorate, with parts of it collapsing following very high winds, until the decision was taken to completely demolish it and clear the site. In the summer of 1944, the ruins were pulled down and the site completely cleared. No part of Borley Rectory survives on the site today. However, Price wrote one more book on the place, The End of Borley Rectory, published in 1946, and he died two years later. His books and press interest in the place since the late 1920s have ensured that the legend of Borley Rectory remains as powerful in 2023 as almost a century before, and still draws people to visit the site. 
What can we say of the so-called hauntings? Rational analysis by many writers suggests that the stories of a nun walking in the grounds were the inventions of the first Reverend Bull's teenage daughters, influenced as they were by contemporary novels and poetry. The house gained a reputation, perhaps deserved, of being haunted in some way, which some locals believed, and later owners of the rectory either believed or actively embellished. The arrival of Harry Price, celebrity ghost hunter, certainly saw the rather Victorian ghostly nun and footsteps phenomena transformed into the more modern poltergeist activity familiar to any viewer of modern horror films. And Marianne Foister admitted to having faked much of them to cover up her tawdry affair with the lodger. The Price lease saw large groups of young and perhaps impressionable students living in a house described to them as the most haunted house in England, obviously running about frightening each other, or being perhaps pranked by Price for his own obvious reasons. And what better way to end the whole sorry saga than a devious insurance job that destroyed the house, leaving its ghostly reputation intact and also fulfilling a prophecy from the seance. Beneath all the nonsense and drama may be a real ghost story, but for many the Borley ghost lived not at the rectory, but across the road at the medieval Borley church. I recall during my visit in the 1980s, going into the church, which was empty at the time, and taking a photograph. After getting it developed, it contained a white, blurry figure halfway down the nave. What it was, I do not know, and as I have long ago lost the photograph, I can't speculate. In the 1970s, researchers placed recording equipment inside the church on several nights, locking the equipment inside. Footsteps, opening doors, banging, and groaning sounds were all clearly audible, and these old programs are available on YouTube if you'd like to examine them. Having recently visited the church alone whilst filming for this program, the place does have a strange and unsettling feeling. I had a feeling all the time of being watched. And quite frankly, it gave me a case of the willies and I was very glad to leave. Turning back to the site of Borley Rectory, I wonder how the people who live in the bungalows that once formed part of the rectory's 11 acres of gardens feel about living in the shadow of England's most haunted house. On a dark and misty night, do they ever look out their kitchen windows at their back gardens that once belonged to the rectory and spy perhaps movement in the darkened trees at the end where nuns walk once led? Have they ever seen the nun walking on her repetitive journey to nowhere? Or do these hardy souls who choose to live in the most infamous village in the world keep their curtains drawn and their blinds shut? A happy All Hallows' Eve to you all. And don't forget, at the witching hour, draw back your bedroom curtains if you dare. You never know what might be lurking at the end of your garden tonight.